Introduced in 1996 as a 1997 model, the 1997 Pontiac Grand Prix was one of the most successful General Motors cars of the 1990s and certainly a sleek vehicle and noted departure from the car that it replaced. Whereas the 1988-96 to model year Pontiac Grand Prix was a much more upright and architectural formed car, the 1997-2003 to Grand Prix was inherently more sleek and sculpted than its predecessor. It also was an excellent seller for Pontiac, doubling the sales upon its introduction in 1997 over the 1996 model year. With a base price just south of $20,000, a potential buyer could have an excellent looking vehicle and one that performed well for a reasonable price. And the sales of the car, which typically numbered about 150,000 units per year, certainly showed that buyers were enamored with its overall looks and value proposition. Fortunately, here on Rare Classic Cars, we have somebody who can tell us the details behind the overall design of the 1997 to 2003 Pontiac Grand Prix, None other than then Pontiac Assistant Chief and later Pontiac Chief Designer, John Manugian. We sit down with John as he details the design of the Pontiac Grand Prix in this two-part series. We hope that you enjoy part one. And when part two is available, you can check the link at the end of the video or in the comments section. Thanks again for watching. Let's listen in to John tell the story of the 1997 to 2003 Pontiac Grand Prix. Well, welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. We're here again with John Manugian and talking about another success, John. Thanks for having me back again. One other thing I need to mention before we go any further, all these videos I've done, it's never just me. It's always a team. And I was so blessed to have had the teams that I had to work with uh, in the Pontiac studio, we had a killer team. These people all contributed to everything that I show you here. I mean, what I show you are my sketches, but the production cars are the product of the work of all these people. So I wanna make that very clear that I couldn't have done anything without all this talent. So. That's that. I see the GM Finance t-shirt there or something, <laughs> right? You know, that was a key, Why not? key yes. element of your team. Of course. Right? Of course. But we, make... you know, we had a great time. We we were the Pontiac Studios were were a hot hot place to work. Hot place to work well, during this period. I mean, yeah, it's kind of the halcyon days of Pontiac before it yes. GM and everything went south. Went south. But so we talked about the Grand Am already with John, uh, the 92 Grand Am. And now, you know, <laughs> I don't know what model year this original, this Grand Prix was supposed to be slated for, but well, later it came out in the mid-90s. Um, and just to kind of back up a little bit, I spent uh, six years, five years in Cadillac. And after my stint in Cadillac, I spent two years in Saturn. So when I came to Pontiac, it was in 87. And they were just, starting to do the Grand Am, which we just talked mm. about, and starting the new Grand Prix. And so we had two huge hits for the corporation. It was the Pontiac franchise. The Grand Am and the Grand Prix were like the volume cars. The the specialty cars, the, the Firebirds, the Sunfires, well, the Sunfires were big volume, but the Bonnevilles, uh, were less volume, but maybe more image conscious cars. But the bread and butter cars were Grand, Grand Prix. So we had, we had our hands full in making sure we didn't screw anything up. So tell us a little, a little bit about, you know, so you entered the studio in 1987, you're working on the Grand Am Grand Prix. It's interesting, the Grand Am came out so much sooner than the Grand Prix. What, what was when going I, on there? When I got to Pontiac in 87, I, I was the assistant chief. Terry Henlein was, was the studio chief. And again, we were just starting the Grand Am and the Grand Prix. And so on a timeline basis, I don't remember if the, the, the Grand Am was always slated for 92. The Grand Prix, I believe, was supposed to be originally a 94. Could have been 93 and a half, 94. But as you recall, GM was going through a financial situation in the early 90s. And so 
as we were working on these programs, we kept getting these messages mm, that delay all or... is not well. You guys have to delay maybe five months, maybe six months, maybe a year. And then uh, the, the corporation's senior senior management, Bob Stemple and, and Lloyd Royce, they left the corporation. We had a new leadership team. There was so much going on, mm. and the financial situation was in such dire straits that the Grand Prix wound up getting delayed several times. And an interesting story that I, I'll probably show you here at some point is the car was pretty much developed uh, very early on in the 90s, but we had a gestation period of three or four additional years where the car just sort of sat there. And we were still refining it and making minor adjustments, but it could have come out probably as a 94 from a design point of view, not financially or manufacturing. But we kind of had everything dialed in earlier on. So when I got there, uh, we were doing Grand Ams, but I was also interested in getting my foot in the door for the Grand Prix. And these were just what ifs don't take these literally a lot of these were almost mid-engine cars but i was again i was trying to get a feel for what could a grand prix form vocabulary be like because we were coming off of a car that was architectural a little stiffer uh, a little more linear and we wanted this car i believed we wanted this car to be uh a lot softer. Mm. One of the things, I'll digress here a bit. One of the things I, ha I found out when I was going to grad school, we had a professor, uh, I can put this down, come in one day and talk about every company, everybody in their life needs to have a BHAG. B H A G. BHAG, okay. BHAG. And it stood for Big Hairy Ass Goal. And that always uh, stuck with me. Now, granted, I learned about the BHAG much later, but intuitively, my BHAG for the Grand Prix was it wants to be a car that's like a, a land Learjet. It wants to be an executive car that is so sleek and so smooth and so beautiful that it's like a Learjet for the ground. So that was my BHAG. So as we progressed and as I started thinking about what could a Grand Prix be, the idea came to us about doing a coupe and a sedan that were one and the same. And everybody sort of mm. said, that'll never work. You can't do that. This is the late 80s. Yes, early 90s, late 80s, but late 80s. And everybody in the corporation was saying, well, you can't do a sedan that's as low as a coupe because then you sacrifice all the function. And I said, well, let them go buy a Buick or a Chevy or an Olds. They didn't, they didn't buy into that. So I kept pushing and we kept pushing as a studio to do a sedan that was like a coupe. And this was before Mercedes did it. This was before any number of people did it. Pontiac was interested in doing a four-door coupe. So these, mm. these sketches were thinking about what could a four-door coupe be. And again, this was a mid-engine car, so just disregard that part of it. But I was, I was flexing my creative juices here. So we did, I did, any number of, of sketches, and uh, they were to be the form study of a four-door sedan that looked like a coupe. And I know that was kind of an oxymoron at the time. And what do you mean by that? So low roof line? Low kind of... roof line, sleek, non-traditional sedan. You know, sedans have always been from the, from the 50s, 40s, upright, wear your hat kind yes. of vehicles. And Pontiac being the excitement division, we said, why can't we, as a, as a division, Pontiac, do something that's really sleek and low, 
Learjet mm -hmm. for the ground, executive. I'm going to be really cool in my four door coupe. Mm. So that's kind of what drove. To get away from the two box kind yes. of design. Yes. That's this sketch is probably too big here, but well, um, <laughs> I'll try to hold it up here. Yeah, but again, you know, this was in the '87, so we were we were just exploring the idea of this soft, sleek, coupe-like sedan. I mean, how cool would that have been at at the time? That was yeah, '87. That was that would have been a big deal. You could put that down put that probably. over here. So. Given that thought process, we started to develop a number of uh, ideas. And using the idea of a coupe and a sedan being one and the same, uh, I, kept, I kept pushing this idea of getting the sedan as low as possible without sacrificing what a coupe could be. So... Mm. Uh, thinking about how could we share and the idea was well if you shared the windshield the roof panel the backlight all the front end sheet metal the deck lid and the rear fascia then all you would need to do the sedan would be the doors and the quarters and the side glass and you'd have a really kick-ass sedan so that was that was the BHAG. That was the mm. big hairy ass goal. So I was sketching coupes, but putting four doors on them. And we were getting everybody's attention. It was like, wow, that looks pretty cool. Can you actually do that? And so we, we kept sketching, looking, searching. Uh, Tom Kearns was in there. He was, he was helping out. Uh, Tom Covert was in there. He was helping out. We were all doing these crazy sedan. It's coupe. amazing these are dated, you know, late 80s. Yes, too. they're all late 80s. And we did, we started to do a, a, a full-size clay. We had done uh, some other proposals in, in clay. You're starting to get that greenhouse look there. Of the yes, production the, car. This, this was the idea of doing a gray a perimeter around the D-line that would define the upper on the car. And that was that was kind of a unique uh, idea at that time as well. Nobody had really done anything quite like that, where you would have a painted gray surround on the D-line. Unfortunately, from manufacturing uh, reasons, you could only have one color of gray. So when you're limited to that one color, it has to go with every body color that you have in the palette. And that, Didn't that quite work. became a problem. I mean, it was, we, we could have done it. it. It could have been done, but it would have been a, a real challenge. But these sketches then started to integrate that gray upper surround and also this very, very soft, fluid, sculpted, uh, body forms that Grand Prix previously did not have. I'm so, surprised. It's so amazing. It's such a departure from, like you said, the previous car. That it was. It was 180 from where the other car was. It's kind of like a first Hyundai Sonata. Or that. Remember that <laughs> Hyundai Sonata? It was so different when it yes. came out. Yeah, yeah. So we did a full-size clay. It's going to be a shocker here. Um, these were, uh, this was probably one of the first uh, clay models on the patio. This probably would have been late 80s, early 90s. And it was, again, it was a very soft sculpted car. It had the gray D line around a, a hidden A pillar. Uh, th this was such a total departure from the previous Grand Prix. It shocked a lot of people. Mm. internally in, in, in the company. But we, we pressed on. So it would have also had a much softer rear end and taillights, uh, much like we were also working on the Grand Am. So the two cars would have looked like they were related, but mm. not identical. And we were doing these apertures that were lower on the front face of the car rather than the traditional grill that was up on top. 
So for a moment, and I'm going to digress here, in July of 1990, someone at GM Photographic downtown had gotten a hold of the photographs that we had of clay models on the patio. And they took their photographs and they sold them to Automobile Magazine out in Ann Arbor. And Automobile Magazine, because they, copyright reasons, they couldn't publish photographs. So they had someone, an artist somewhere, take the photographs and do renderings of the car. And they, they published it in this magazine. And I can't tell you what a bizarre situation this was when <laughs> we picked up the magazine and there was the Grand Prix that we were projecting for 1994. This is 93. With the gray D-line too. They, ha they had the photographs. They were literally working off the stolen photographs. Now we heard that uh, General Motors prosecuted and the gentleman wound up going to prison because he stole these photographs and had them printed, sold them for money. But this was such a huge shock for us because to see our clay model on the cover of a national magazine was like unheard of. And the bizarre thing was that was the car. It wasn't like an artist's interpretation. Right. That was the car. So we we got kind of panicky but then we said well nobody's probably going to believe that they, they won't believe that uh, that's the actual car because gm's not going to release photographs of the car but that was the car so did that drive the next iteration like we got well, a change or was it no ac actually we stuck with that theme for the for throughout the gestation of the program and so but in the meantime you're you're iterating the design and when you look at this design, which is where we were at, at that particular point, snapshot in time, the, the car uh, resolved the front end to a little different design down the road. So this was the design at this point in 1990, but as we progressed uh, over time, we were refining the design and the design elements uh, mm, to get ribs, John. Mm. Yeah, yes, the infamous ribs. But you kept it off the body side, though. You were. We did. You were trying really hard. I was trying to... very hard not to do ribs. Thanks again for watching this interview with John Manugian on the 1997 to 2003 Pontiac Grand Prix. When part two is available, you can see it in the link below, or check it out in the comment section. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care.